Left and right, uh, terrifying stuff. If you've ever met one, just run for the hills. You can tell they're wearing a hat like mine usually. Uh, that you've got retreat spaces that really aren't following any sort of traditional pathway when it comes to psychedelics and the medicines that they're giving out. And that's incredibly dangerous. Uh, and then you've got therapists that are committing tremendous misconduct in this space. Uh, and that's really bewildering as well because people are coming, like they would come to a doctor to feel better, to be healed, and that's not the treatment that they're often getting. But that's not what we're talking about. Uh, if you've been at this conference throughout the week and been to past iterations of this conference, you know the attendance isn't quite what it's been in the past couple of years. And what I'm here to tell you is that that's completely okay. Hold on, I'm gonna check the laser pointer again. Nope, all right, that's fine. Uh, what I'm here to talk about is why as a venture capitalist, probably the leading investor in the pre-seed and seed stages of psychedelic med investment uh, in startups, uh, why I'm more bullish than ever. You know, for the past couple years, we've been investing about a million dollars a quarter uh, at Mystic and looking to double or triple that. Despite perhaps a bit of uh, deflation in expectations and excitement around the space, which I would argue is actually a good thing. The problems I just discussed that this talk was initially supposed to be out are very much real. Uh, this is an industry that, as everyone knows, was, has undergone a prohibition. Well, before it was an industry, you know, in the 60s and 70s, pretty much every well-known psychedelic was turned into a, a class one, uh, a schedule one narcotic, like crack cocaine or heroin. And it's because these drugs, medicines, whatever you want to call them, they have a, a tremendous impact on the brain. Uh, and th that can be used for good, and that can be used for bad. But what I really like to discuss is why today, more than ever, these medicines are necessary. We have a tremendous mental health crisis, whether you're talking about suicidal, rising rates of uh, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, loneliness is a huge problem in our society. And people keep on taking more and more drugs to feel better, and those drugs aren't working. Uh, psychiatric drugs as we know them today are like band-aids uh, on a, a gaping wound. It's really not going to address the underlying issue. Maybe it will stop some of the immediate problems, but they're dampeners. They don't actually go and fix the underlying root cause of the problems people are facing. And thus, what you have is a massive market opportunity. You have you know, people that are not happy with the treatments that they're getting or unwilling to take the treatments that exist in modern psychiatry because they don't want to just feel numb. They want to feel like themselves or better. And the drugs that exist today do not treat that. And so the market we're looking at right here really isn't representative of the market opportunity that exists with psychedelics because it's not just about not feeling shitty. It's about feeling your best. And that's not what the drugs today provide. And, and so, what you talk, so when we talk about medicine, closer, I thought it was too loud, okay. Uh, so when we talk about medicine, in the, the Western context, which has existed for a couple hundred years, we talk about sickness. In order to get a drug approved by the FDA, the only way that you can do that is by treating an indication for someone who is sick. Somebody who is, as they call in the medical com community, a healthy normal, cannot receive a drug, you cannot make a drug for a healthy, normal person. But raise your hands if you know a healthy, normal person. I don't, I, I, I mean, I'm certainly not. I mean, maybe I'm healthy enough, I'm definitely not normal. And, and I don't think that's something that anyone should aspire to. And yet, as an individual that might be perceived as healthy and normal by the medical community, I still often want to feel better. I, 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 I want to not just be not sick, 
I want to be the very best possible version of myself, and that is what these medicines can offer. And this is why, you know, looking back at the last slide, we had, we had you know, a, tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars in market opportunity that exists in treating sick, sick people. But what about people that are well, the, these healthy normals? Uh, that is an opportunity that right now the supplement business kind of covers, but you don't really kind of know what you're getting because once again, you can't go and do an FDA trial for a treatment for healthy normal people. And so when we think about the opportunity being possessed presented by psychedelics, I think it's great that we're going after the medical opportunities first. Uh, the medicalization of psychedelics is obviously a first step, but we have to look beyond that in terms of mind-body optimization. You know, there are a lot of folks here talking about longevity, and not to knock that industry, I think it's great to live long, healthy lives, but the issue I had coming up in the world of Silicon Valley was that there were all these transhumanists, these folks that want to live forever that talk about longevity. I was like, and I looked at most of the people that spoke about that. This is not to talk about any of the speakers or attendees here that are here for the longevity part of things. But I was like, I wouldn't want a day in your shoes. Most people are not happy as they live right now, so why are you working on people living forever when we really need to address the human condition as it is? Let's live well today, then let's worry about living forever. Uh, and, and so, <laughs> clearly most of the people here were for the psychedelic portion. Uh, uh, longevity is great, by the way, because people need to live long, healthy lives. But living forever is a bit too much ego, and probably some of those folks need some 5-MEO. Uh, <laughs> um, one of the bigger issues here is the cost that mental health has on our economy. People cannot live not only just fulfilled, happy lives, it's hard to live a productive life if you're cr chronically depressed, chronically anxious. And as I said earlier, when you're taking most of the psychiatric drugs that exist on the market today, the real problem that you have is that you're just dampening those negative symptoms, if you will. You're not actually feeling like the best version of you, and anyone that has to go to a job that they perhaps don't love, I'm lucky enough to be one of those people that loves what I do, but a lot of people, you know, work to live. If you work to live and you want to actually maximize your output, you, you can't just feel numb. You actually have to feel good about what you're doing. It's hard to find purpose when you are numb. And so what I think about as I invest in these medicines and, and, and kind of invest my life into this space is thinking about helping people find purpose. And, and, because without purpose, you're never going to, one, be the best version of yourself, but in anything you do, whether it's with your family, whether it's with your work, with, when you're a participant in daily life, dampening is not what people need. What people truly need is fulfillment and for anyone that has had a psychedelic experience, you know that this is a huge catalyst for how you can get there. Right now, despite perhaps uh, depreciation in market values and less investor interest, the fact is that the PAVE is being passed in a very real way for the legalization, or better term, medicalization, and safer access to these uh, tools. Uh, you know, I'm not a huge believer in full-blown legalization. Um, if you're an American, you know that most Americans probably shouldn't be able to buy mushrooms or LSD at a dispensary. I'm sorry, we just like guns and driving drunk too much. It's, uh, it, it, you know, we saw the airplane analogy earlier. It's just, it, you know, I think it, from a medical standpoint, psychedelics are great. I think from a microdosing standpoint, if, if it can be rolled out successfully, great idea. And I think there's, there should be a new ways for people to take these substances, whether you call it a retreat or just like a playground for adults where people without guns or cars can take these medicines with their friends, have psychedelic experiences. But what we shouldn't try to do here is replicate what has happened with cannabis. Cannabis, 
uh, from some of my sources, looks like it's going to be rescheduled within the next year by the end of the Biden administration, moved from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3, medicalized, which is great. But the, one of the problems that cannabis always faced was that cannabis is a really great recreational drug. It works as a good medicine for some people. Uh, but when you compare the medical applications of cannabis to those um, of traditional drugs on the market, you don't have heightened efficacy. You don't see tremendously better results than anything that exists. When it comes to psychedelic medicine, we're seeing, you know, if you look at MAPS, MDMA, uh, phase three uh, trial results, 71% of uh, participants that were part of the 12 to 16 week uh, trials for treating PTSD, 71% of them no longer qualified for a PTSD diagnosis. That is the most successful psychiatric drug trial in history. The, the results and the efficacy that we are getting with psilocybin, MDMA, a handful of new compounds and traditional compounds are unlike anything we've ever seen. And thus, what we need to be thinking about is sure, we use the states in the United States, and sorry, this is a very Americanized slide, but, but America will be a, tra a trailblazer here. Uh, what we have to think about is that the medical results, this is kind of what Hamilton was talking about. You know, you have academics, you have people from within government or now outside of government, like the governor Rick Perry that, uh, of Texas, of all places, that are talking about, look, look at what the science shows us. This isn't as hard of an argument as cannabis, which has a really great recreational argument, much better than alcohol, I think we can all agree. But from a medicalized argument, these psych psychedelic medicines need to be available to uh, everyone, everywhere, in a safe, controlled medical environment as soon as possible. And so the patchwork framework that existed with cannabis really will not work um, if we want people to feel better, to, to do everything that we talked about earlier in this presentation, achieve fulfillment. And so my hope here is that these state level and, uh, and even city level initiatives will help us understand how to best roll this out in a me medicalized format nationwide in a couple, two to three years, but we can't wait decades for this because we have a mental health crisis. We have people that are lost and directionless, uh, polarized in, in, in the social and political environment that we live in. And fortunately right now, this is very bipartisan. We have generations of veterans that are shell-shocked, traumatized, fucked up by the wars we've sent them to. And as I just said, a, 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 a world where people are addicted to these supercomputers in their pockets with effectively crave, caveman brains. I mean, I posted a meme yesterday on Instagram, you know, uh, I am overstimulated 24 seven when I'm really supposed to be in a cave eating berries. Uh, we're not supposed to be hyper-connected like we are today. And, and, and we need ways to kind of break out of the matrix, if you will. I want to talk about the market size. We've already talked about it a bit. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, the opportunity for these medicines, drugs, wellness tools is going up. But if you look at the funding to psychedelic companies, this is the publicly announced stuff, it's going down. When I came into this industry, it was 2021, I was like, oh God, this is crazy. This reminds me of my decade in Bitcoin. Like everyone's crazy. None of this is going to happen quickly. It's going to crash. Here we are. It's kind of crashed. Uh, what I like to say is that this is not a bad thing. Uh, while these numbers are not correct, you know, we're, we're north of $100 million in venture funding, probably closer to a quarter billion dollars in venture funding this year. And it was higher last year as well. Um, we've, uh, if you're familiar with the concept of the Gartner hype, hype cycle, uh, we're uh, just past the peak of inflated expectations. Oh, that is louder, sorry about that. Uh, it, right now we're in the trough of disillusionment. Uh, but there's really no reason to be disillusioned. I didn't have the chart for this, but if you look at the academic research coming out, 
the number of drug trials that are going into phase two or phase three, um, it's at an ever-growing rate. The actual work that needs to be done, the science, the research, the trials, the validation for everything that we're doing, it's just going up right now. And so you can't just look at the money numbers. I mean, this is one of my problem when I'm talking to investors. They're like, oh, look at the stock market. Uh, you know, all psychedelic drug companies are down. I was like, well, look at all biotech companies. Look at the S&P 500. If you're, if you're correlating the success of an industry to the amount of money going into it, rather than the research coming out of it, the science, the validation, the number of people being healed. I mean, you, you, you look to uh, Gen Z, which is kind of the generation you want to look at as an investor. They're not touching alcohol. I mean, they're not interested in it. They're already kind of depressed and fucked up as it is. Uh, <laughs> No offense to any Gen Z in here, I don't see too many. Uh, but but, but they, they're much more interested in these psychedelics. You, you want a barometer of where the future lies uh, in medicine and, and investing, you, you look to the youngest generation. And so that's where the opportunity exists. It's less when it comes to you know, where the money is today. Markets are irrational. What you look to is the sentiment and people feel polarized and, and they feel isolated. And these medicines are unlike anything else that exists in the world in terms of helping people get towards what they want in today's zeitgeist. So these are, these are kind of the key market driving points. You know, you, you, you've got regulatory um, openness that has never existed before. You have, uh, you have a pharmaceutical industry that doesn't serve anyone. I mean, I haven't seen public polling recently, but nobody really thinks Big Pharma is there to help them. I mean, I don't know if anyone does. And, and so what you have to think about is how do you ensure that we help people that are not being served, and it's by doing what we're doing today. It doesn't matter what anyone else is saying. It doesn't matter how many people are at a conference. If you're working in this industry or thinking about working in this industry, now is the time because this is something that we all know that people need, and the markets will catch up. It, 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 you know, investors are generally pretty stupid, including myself. I'm wrong more than I'm right. It's actually one of the only businesses where you can get paid to be wrong more than you're right. Uh, it's great to be a VC. Uh, but, 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 but don't look to the market. Don't look to where people are putting their money now. Because for 95% of the things that we're doing in the psychedelic medicine space, people can't pay for now anyway. It, it will catch up. Uh, the, the markets will catch up. The opportunities will catch up. Uh, it's, it, it's about, you know, coming from Silicon Valley in the last decade, which was the age of unicorns, these billion dollar private companies. One thing I always like to tell my CEOs, I tell all my CEOs in this space, is don't be a unicorn, be a cockroach. Survive. You know, do not try to, you know, shine with your magical horn and, you know, piss marshmallows. Really what you want, oh, poop marshmallows, excuse me. Um, uh, what you really want to do is survive until you can make money doing what you're doing. Don't depend on people like me as much as you can avoid it. And really just push through because the great thing about this space is we all know what we're doing is important. But you just need to wait for the world to see that. So survival is what's key here. It's, it's really not about thriving in the present moment. Try to do that for yourself at a personal level. But in terms of building, working in this space, it's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. We're at the precipice, the very earliest stages. And so it's about surviving right now. If you look at the sorts of companies I'm investing in, it, 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 it's across the board. It's from sectional, uh, sexual uh, wellness, it's to breath work, sound therapy, VR, you know, traditional drug development, drug discovery, retreat spaces, CPG brands, many of whom are here, incredible companies. It's about giving people, and you can find this all on our website, which will be on the last slide, so don't worry about it. Uh, but it's about giving people the tools that they need now, the tools that they need later, uh, and really just working for a better future that may not exist today, may not exist tomorrow, a year, 
sometimes even a decade from now if you're an early stage drug developer, but it's about developing and building the world that you want to live in. And that's what we're all doing, and that's why being here right now and being a part of this space is so existentially important. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to take questions, and it can be about nothing I spoke about. I've, I've got seven minutes. Just shout. Do you have a question? Um, just FYI, he was the first person to do psychedelics at zero gravity. That's true. <laughs> so so a, a bit, bit of context here. So the first time I went skydiving, I was like, oh, I should do this on LSD. And so I did that. <laughs> and, and, and then the first time I went scuba diving, I was like, all right, well, I should keep up this trend. And, and then I, I, I convinced my uh, crypto billionaire friend to rent out a zero gravity airplane for uh, his 40th birthday. I was like, well, now I'm definitely doing acid. Uh, <laughs> and I have to say, it was the most transcendent, transcendent experience in my life. Uh, highly recommend it, uh, but only if you're very experienced. Uh, are there any questions? Yes, hold on. I also plan to go to space on acid. I, um, I have a, an adopted daughter who has schizophrenia, and I wonder now as you venture with um, various medicines into the future of mental health, do you have anything that you can say, you know, this is something you should go towards with psychosis? So I, so I have a lot to say about that, and I don't think there are too many questions, so I'll get into it for a second. Uh, when I, I had a rough and tumbled childhood, and by the time I had adolescence, um, my brain chemistry was just fucked. I was angry, depressed, suicidal on, on, on a pretty much a weekly basis. I was on five different psychiatric drugs. Uh, and I was also like getting arrested, suspended from school, I would get kicked out a few times, uh, and I was experimenting with drugs, believe it or not. <laughs> and one day my friends were like, oh, we got mushrooms. I was like, well, those make you like see shit, right? And so I, I was like, let's do it. I uh, was scrawny, 14-year-old, Meneer Charai's version of me, ate 3.5 grams of mushrooms, which for anyone that's experienced knows that's pretty full dose for a full-grown adult. Uh, fortunately, despite, you know, whatever psychiatric issues I had, which I certainly had some, uh, it was a transcendent experience, to say the least. Uh, I was a bit of an atheist back then, so I wouldn't say I found God, but I, in retrospect, I certainly found God. And after that experience, despite, like, getting caught by my parents, my mom wanted to take me to the hospital, I... Uh, I woke up the next morning and I never had suicidal ideation again. It turned to uh, an uh, annual tradition be before it became a much more than annual tradition uh, with uh, me and my friends. And uh, a year later, what, the next time I sat with the, the mushrooms, although sitting with the mushrooms is a bit too formal, it was not in any way a medicine in my mind at that time. Um, during that experience, uh, even though I just said it wasn't a medicine, uh, God or whatever you want to call it, um, told me, uh, get off the psychiatric drugs. I was on like antipsychotics, antidepressants, mood stabilizers, tranquilizers. I mean, it was, it was, it was a whole uh, cocktail. And uh, I got off all those drugs and I've had a major depressive episode in 17 years. And... <laughs> Thank you. And it's not something we talk a lot about in this space. We don't talk about giving teenagers or kids these significantly mind-altering substances. But since I really threw myself into this space, it's something I talk about. Um, and, and talking about conditions that people say preclude you from these studies, whether it is schizophrenia or probably bipolar, which is a spectrum that I fell and probably still fall on. Um, it, it, and yet, I believe that done correctly, following the same procedures that we take when going through an FDA trial, real scientific rigidity, we can find solutions for these conditions that I struggle to call illnesses. If, if we want to assume that I was never diagnosed with bipolar, but I'm 
a bit hypomanic, as you can probably tell. Uh, I, I see that my ADHD has superpowers. They, they're why I am uh, standing in front of you today. Well, that in psychedelics. Uh, and, and so the idea that these medicines that deeply affects the consciousness that maybe have been stigmatized in our society um, could actually help make them more positive and beneficial isn't ludicrous. I mean, if you look at studies of schizophrenia in indigenous cultures in a Africa and, and, and South America, people who are sch schizophrenic are not like the people in mental institutions and drugged up. They're, they, 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 they're, they're the elders. Uh, they're the medicine men, medicine men. They're the ones that speak to the ancestors and are revered in their societies. It's only in the West that someone with schizophrenia is seen as crazy or unwell. And it's because there's a negative, they're told those voices in their head. They're told that their swings in mood are bad things, not things that can be harnessed and actually allow them to be fulfilled and achieve their potential. And so for me, I, I want to see more studies. I'm not going to tell anyone that's, you know, seriously bipolar or has a history of schizophrenia or psychosis to go eat a bunch of mushrooms and wander around with their friends. It may end very badly. But should we be taking, undertaking studies to see these medicines or new compounds can help? Absolutely, and in fact, one of my portfolio companies that will go unnamed for now, they're here, uh, they are an AI-driven uh, drug discovery company, and they were trying to determine their first indication. I was like, look, I think I was bipolar as a kid. I think I still am bipolar. Why don't you go look to see if there are any good hits uh, for potentially helping treat bipolar with uh, your uh, uh, deep learning system? Sure enough, they found a hit with a compound that's never been used in modern psychiatry that, based off of current drugs on the market, would be at least five times more efficacious. And so, yes, that's a long answer to your question. I, I, I think these uh, medicines have a huge potential in treating psychosis and other um, problematic uh, illnesses in our society, but potentially could be harnessed in a really good way. We have one more question. Quick well, question. Quick, quick follow-up, I oh, think. Follow-up. Are there any trials that you're familiar with um, in regards to psychedelic and psychosis at the moment? No. Everyone's scared. I mean, look, this is, it's only become acceptable in academia and the scientific community to be doing these studies in the past five years. Like God bless Roland Griffiths, uh, rest in peace, uh, for, for really kick-starting all of this. David Nutt in the UK, many more. Uh, but no, I, people are not talking. I mean, uh, you have some studies around bad trips. Uh, Robin Carhart Harris at UCSF, uh, former, formerly at Imperial, he's studying like bad trips and what induces them. But no, I think it's, it's too precarious. I, I think uh, most uh, medical review boards would never allow it. It's like if you believe these substances can induce psychosis, we're not going to let you give them for studies. And so we're not there yet, uh, but I hope it's something that can be addressed in the next decade. Thank you so much. A hand of applause. Thank you.